It's a pleasure to introduce to you Sam Helfont, who is an associate scholar of the Foreign Policy Research Institute while he's completing his dissertation uh, at Princeton University in the Department of Near East Studies. He's, uh, for his dissertation, he's writing about the uh, regime of Saddam Hussein based upon the millions of documents that were captured in 2003. And there's a handful of scholars who are combing through these documents uh, to see what they reveal about that uh, regime. And uh, Sam is one of them. In the meantime, he has already written uh, two monographs, one on Yusuf al-Kawadawi, who is widely considered the highest profile Sunni cleric in the Middle East, and another volume on the Sunni divide, which is about the differences between Wahhabism and the Muslim Brotherhood, which could well be the subject of this lecture, but instead he's talking about the Sunni-Shia divide, which began uh, almost with the beginnings of uh, Islam, but now has reopened in a new way in the aftermath of the Arab Spring, if we wish to call it that. Anyway, please welcome Sam Helfont. Thanks, Alan. Thanks for FPRI for holding this. And you forgot, of course, my greatest accolade, which is I am the husband of uh, the organizer here, Tali Helfon. <laughs> yes. So uh, yeah, the subject of my talk is going to be the Sunni-Shia divide in a post-Arab uh, Spring Middle East. Uh, but being that this is a history institute, I'm going to start well before the uh, Arab Spring, as uh, Alan just mentioned. This issue goes all the way back to the uh, to the origins of, uh, of Islam. And as uh, Adam Garfinkel briefly just mentioned in his talk, uh, there was a New York Times article. It's a very interesting article. I'll go into a little bit more details. In 2006, in October 2006, uh, a New York Times uh, journalist named Jeff Stein goes to DC and starts asking questions about the Sunni Shi divide. This is five years after 9-11, right? Uh, this was the, the, the summer before, I mean the summer right after the Israeli war with Hezbollah, right, so this Shi organization. Uh, we've been in Iraq now for uh, three and a half years. So he figured these are big issues, these are important issues, right, and he goes to congressman, congressman, not just any congressman, but congressman sitting on the intelligence, uh, the intelligence committee, right, intelligence oversight committee. They have no idea. He goes to uh, a director of counterterrorism at the FBI. Counterterrorism at the FBI, right? The guy who's, who's supposed to be tracking these groups. Uh, talks to him about Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah. Doesn't know which one is which, as far as, you know, the Sunni Shia divide, and says that it's not important, which is uh, quite a outstanding, uh, an amazing statement for someone uh, to say. So, being that these are clearly a problem of, of understanding uh, what is, what, who are the Sunnis, who are the Shis, uh, that's going to be the beginning of uh, what I'm going to try to do here. So in the beginning, we're going to talk about who are, or what are, uh, Sunnis and Shis, right? This is a very important foundation to any understanding before we can get to uh, the dynamic after the Arab Spring. And then just as important as who they are is, is where they are, because this is also very important. Right? Uh, and finally, does it matter, right? Because that's not an obvious question. I mean, sometimes in, we, can, we can just propose that it is an obvious question, right? Um, but it, as we'll see, it's not as obvious as, as you might think. Um, if so, which may I give you a clue that it kind of is, uh, how so, right? And then I'll get to, uh, you know, Sunnis and Shis before the Arab Spring and then, and then afterwards, because the Arab Spring does mark a change, which we'll see, but it's not, it's not, it doesn't come from nowhere. There was already some developments going on, and the Arab Spring has sort of exasperated them. All right, so the origins of the sunni shia divide. As Many of you probably know, uh, it goes all the way back to almost the very beginning. Muhammad is, is the founder of Islam. He's preaching in the early 7th century, right? Uh, but when Muhammad dies, there is some debate as what happened. Who, who's going to be his follower, right? Who's going to be the next person who comes after him, the caliph, which means the successor, right? Uh, and there are two schools of thought. One is that he didn't say anything, right? He didn't, he didn't leave anyone. These, come the Sunnis and they say, well, the best person to lead the community, the person who's most learned, most pious, best able, most capable, 
he should leave, right? And these are the Sunnis. Then there's another group that says no. Uh, his, kin, his family, his family should, should lead, right? And his closest relative is Ali, who marries his daughter, Fatima. Ali's already his cousin. As we mentioned, there are first cousin marriages, right? It's quite common. Uh, Ali is his cousin, marries uh, his daughter, right? And this forms a line, the line of, 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 of the, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, right? Uh, Ali, followers of Ali don't get their way at first. There's, there's uh, two other, there's a, uh, well, Ali's the fourth, right? So then there'd be two other caliphs in, in between Omar and Uthman come first. And finally, Ali gets his chance, right? Ali gets his chance. He's a caliph. Uh, but Islam is, there's a bit, there's a lot of strife going on. Ali is killed, right? And there, this reopens the, the divide between the two camps. Because the Sunnis do consider Ali to have been a legitimate, you know, a good, he's one of the, the rightly guided caliphs, one of, the, one of uh, completely legitimate, it was a great time, he should have been caliph. Uh, but his followers, you know, th th there's a divide afterwards, after Ali is killed. Uh, you have the first caliph after Ali, according to the Sunnis, is Muawiyah, right? And he moves to Damascus and becomes the first Umayyad caliph. And then Ali's... Uh, Faction is led by his son, his sons. His first son is uh, Hassan, and Hassan sort of makes amends with what's going on, doesn't cause too much trouble, but then he again is killed, and the next son comes up. His name is Hussein. Now, Hussein is the main, the main figure for... Hussein and Ali are the, are the two main figures for the Shi'is. Hussein uh, comes at the same time as Muawiyah dies, and his son Yazid takes over, and Hussein decides... He's going to make a stand. He's going to bring the Shi'is back to power, right? He goes, uh, he is called to his, by his followers to go up into Iraq, where along the way he is betrayed by the community and uh, ransacked by the uh, Umayyad armies, right? So Ali only has about 70 people. You can see him over here. His faction is with the camels, and they're sort of surrounded by the armies and then eventually slaughtered. Now, this is a, for Shi'is, this is a, like a, an enormous event, right? Uh, this is the grandson of the prophet. This is the prophet's line. This is the family. And these people who are calling themselves Muslims are out here slaughtering him, right? So whether or not you believe that he should be uh, the rightful caliph or, or in charge, you shouldn't be killing, you know, the, the, the prophet's line, right? And this has become the centerpiece of, of Shiism today, uh, this event. Uh, if you see these pictures sometimes in Iraq of people uh, beating themselves, right? These are she's, and they're beating themselves after performing passion plays about this event where how did us Muslims let this happen, right? Uh, and it becomes a very emotional issue. Uh, and really the centerpiece of, uh, creates a lot of angst and, and, and hatred between, uh, of, the, of the she's for the situation that, they're, that they find themselves in. Okay, so what happens afterwards? Now this is very complicated, and the whole point of this isn't to memorize it, but just to know that it's very complicated, right? Uh, <laughs> After Ali dies, because it's impossible to understand what's going on today without understanding some of the, the complexity here. After Hussein dies, uh, the, the idea in Shiism is that it's passed down to the son, right? And then that the son will always uh, create a successor, right? The problem is that some of the sons, well, they get killed before they have a successor. So what do you do? Well, some people say this son actually went into a state of hiding, uh, what's called occultation. Uh, and he's going to come back as the Messiah, right? Others say, no, no, actually he did pass it on. He passed it on to someone else. So there's, there's disagreement about where the actual line goes, right? If, if the Shi'is believe that the line of the Prophet Muhammad needs to, be, uh, needs to rule, uh, there are different interpretations of which way that line goes. The main line is, uh, you see here, it's Twelver. These are the Iranians of the vast majorities of, of Shi'is today. But there are other groups that you might recognize the names. Uh, there are Druze. Uh, there are Zaydis, uh, the Alawis are also a uh, type of, of Shis in that they believe, uh, at least they sided with Ali in these battles, right? Um, so the Twelvers are the main, we'll get to that, uh, and there's some of these other ones are found in different places. They're not as important, but they do exist. Okay, so where are Sunnis and Shis? Well, you see the map here, right? So the blue side, this is where uh, it's more Shis, right? And it's, it's focused on uh, Iran and Iraq are the two main places. Bahrain is in there. Um, Yemen has, has some. Uh, but the majority of the Middle East and the majority of the Muslim world is Sunni. Right? We'll get to some specifics of this 
uh, exactly what's happened. As uh, Professor Reynolds mentioned earlier, Iran turned Shi officially in the 16th century, and they are the sort of Shi power. So there's a sort of blob there of the Iranian, of Iran, and there's a whole bunch of Shis in there. Uh, southern Iraq has the Shi holy sites, uh, but really it's a, it's a, there are newer Shis there. They're, they only come in the 19th century. Um, and then down towards in the Persian Gulf, you see on the east coast of Saudi Arabia, this is all sort of in this Iranian orbit. And then some other places you have the Shi'is, a lot of these other little blobs are, are in mountain, mountain districts, uh, which is important because if the Sunnis dominate, um, the only places that Shi'is can really survive uh, and thrive are in places that are inaccessible to, to the powers, especially to the Ottoman Empire. So you have up in the mountains there in Yemen, these are very high mountains, you have a, a, a small sect called the Zaydis there up there. In, in Lebanon, you know, known for big mountains, uh, you have the Shi'is sort of surviving outside of the grasp of, of the powers that be. Um, another important place to look, we'll get to Iraq uh, later on, but down the, the east coast of, of Saudi Arabia there on the Persian Gulf, so this is a very small portion of, of Saudi Arabia that has this sort of strip of Shi'is, but uh, that's where all the oil is. So it makes it a lot more important, right? The Shi'is actually control a lot of the oil. When you hear Persian Gulf and the oil, well, it goes, it goes all around the oil. Uh, you know, in southern Iraq, that's where uh, most of the oil is. There's some up in Kurdistan, too, in Iran, and on the east coast of, of the Arabian Peninsula. There's no oil, really, in the middle of the Arabian Peninsula, not much. Uh, there's no oil in the Sunni areas of Iraq, which are, uh, you know, to the west, which obviously plays a big role in how uh, politics uh, are conducted. And a lot of this, again, goes back to, uh, we've heard earlier, the difference, you know, the Ottoman Empire, right? The Ottoman Empire was a Sunni empire, so most of the states that are in the Ottoman Empire uh, end up being uh, Sunni, except for if they're in some of these inaccessible places where the Ottomans can't really get to them and the, the trends of, uh, of the age aren't applicable. Okay, so these are the main sects, Sunnis and Shis. You're already better off than Congress, right? Um, but the question the, still is there. Does it matter, right? Does this matter? Okay, these are Sunnis here. These are Shis there. This is where they are. Some of them have oil. Some of them don't. They're in mountains. So what, right? Uh, so who cares, right? And, and the question is taken for granted in the West usually that it does matter, right? Uh, but as we'll see, that, that question shouldn't be taken for granted because Sunni Shi identity is, is one of many identities like anything else, right? If you think of in America, we have uh, different religious and ethnic identities, and, and, and sometimes the hyphen goes here, and sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes people vote because they're a woman, and sometimes because they're African American or, or whatever else. There's nothing to say that one identity is always going to be more important uh, than the others, and, and Sunni Shis are no difference, no different. Okay, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. So, some examples of when it doesn't matter, right? Abdul Karim al Qasim. He's the first prime minister of Iraq after the monarchy is overthrown. Right? Uh, he's a dictator, right? Like everyone else. But he's sort of well liked, right? Especially now in post 2003 Iraq, there's a lot of nostalgia for his reign. Uh, he was a general, right? So he rose up through the ranks. There was nothing impeding him rising up through the ranks. But he was half Sunni and half Shi, right? So this tells us a lot already about the state of, of society uh, that, that he was living in, right? First of all, that a Sunni can marry a Shi, right? That wouldn't be the case probably today in Iraq, uh, except for if you were outside of whatever constraints that are existing in society. Um, he's also half Kurd, too. So he's a sort of perfect Iraqi leader. If there was ever going to be the embodiment of what should have happened in Iraq, this is the guy, right? Half Sunni, half Shi, half Arab, half Kurd. But he was killed. So anyway, but, yeah, I guess that's what happens, right? You get the perfect guy. Um, but just his existence should tell us a lot about the non-importance of sectarianism sometimes, that someone like this could exist, and that he could rise up through the ranks, and that people could look back at him uh, fairly nostalgically, right? Uh, Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran. Now, Iran is clearly a Shi power, right? And this Islamic revolution certainly emboldened Shi's across the Middle East, right? But Khomeini actually reached out to Sunnis and he tried to make, he tried to present himself as 
not as sectarian as we might think of him, right? So he, he gets rid of some of the uh, restrictions from Sunnis, praying behind Shis, right, and, and, and vice versa. Uh, if you look at early uh, revolutionary Iran, there is uh, the glorification of certain Sunni, Sunni rulers and, and Sunni intellectuals. There's a guy by the name of Said Qutub, which we might hear about later, I'm not sure, uh, with the lecture on the Muslim Brotherhood, but he's a, a Sunni Muslim brother, a very important uh, intellectual. And, they, and they, in Iran, a postage stamp appears with him, right? And there are streets named after him. So there is this sort of idea that, uh, no, these Sunnis are also, you know, good Muslims and, and trying to blur the lines between them and, and create an Islamic identity, right? So even though he is a Shi, and clearly the Shi identity is very important to him, there is a, a push towards, uh, towards blurring those lines and downplaying sectarian identities. And there is a, you know, a reciprocal response on behalf of some Sunnis, the Muslim Brotherhood, for example. Right? We already mentioned Said Qutub's postage stamp. Well, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood is very, there, there are celebrations in the street when Khomeini's Islamic revolution takes over. Uh, certain Offshoots of the Muslim Brotherhood, such as uh, today, uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, uh, are still very much, uh, you know, their thought is very much based on, on Ayatollah Khomeini. They're a Sunni group, and, and he's a, you know, a Shi'i leader. And they're still, you know, very closely tied to Iran. So these ideas that, you know, it's only going to be Sunnis or only versus only going to be uh, Shi'is isn't necessarily always the case. The same thing we could say with the ruling party in Turkey uh, now. Now, we'll see there's been some evolution, but when they come to power, right, they are a semi-Islamist uh, group, at least their lineage is, is, uh, comes out of Islamist movements in Turkey, and they come to power with this idea of, we're going to have no problems with our neighbors, right? And what they're talking about is Iran on one side, right? Uh, this is a Shi, the Turkey is, is almost all Sunni, uh, and Iran are these Shis, and they're saying, we're not going to have any problems with them, right? They're also saying with uh, the heirs below them, the Assad regime uh, in Syria, you know, which is a proto-Shi, uh, right? They're Alawites, which is a type of, you could say, type of Shi, at least closer to the Shi's than they are to the Sunnis. And he's also saying, no, we're not going to have a problem with them either. These are all good Muslims, and we're all we're going to be we're going to be good with everybody because we're Muslims. We're not different sects, right? He makes uh, not a pilgrimage, but certain visits to southern Iraq to the Shi holy sites. He's trying to present himself as a Muslim first and not as a uh, sectarian. Okay, but sometimes it does matter. And when it matters, it really matters, right? Uh, when these sectarian tensions erupt into conflict, these are some of the nastiest conflicts you're going to see, right? Uh, most of us are familiar with post-2003 Iraq. I mean, we've seen some really disgusting stuff, right? Killing kids and women, torture, mutilation, everything you can think of. Uh, when these tensions start coming to the surface, right? Because when religious tensions become the basis of it, right? You think back to this battle where they, they slaughter the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the family of the prophet. This, is, this becomes a supernatural type battle, right? You're not battling, you're not fighting against someone who has, who has different interests than you. You don't disagree over a border. You disagree over, you know, this, these guys are the embodiment of evil that have come here to destroy everything that's good in the world. Right? Can't let them even exist as people. Right? Uh, there were certain people in Iraq who were calling for just slaughtering all the Shis, 60% of the population. That's how they were going to deal with it. Right? There were certain Shis who felt the same way about the Sunnis in Iraq. But Iraq isn't the only place. Lebanon was mostly Christians versus Sunnis, but there are you know, Sunni-Shi divides uh, going on in Lebanon. And this was, a, again, a brutal war. People, I mean, just absolutely doing disgusting, horrible things. Uh, and this isn't only a modern phenomenon. It goes back, you know. We talk about the Ottomans and the Persians. We've heard, heard a lot about them already today. I mean, they were fighting these wars for, for a long time. And, and sometimes it mattered, and sometimes it didn't, right? It's a constellation of factors that come together in very complex ways to make certain things matter at certain times and places and not matter in other times and places. Uh, and it's the same with the Sunnis and Shi'is. So I'm just going to check my time. Okay, so how do Middle Eastern states deal with this problem, right? Because it's a complex issue, because it's not black and white, and because sometimes it matters and sometimes it doesn't, different states have come out with different ways to handle this. Lebanon, 
as enforced sectarian rights, right? There are three major groupings in Lebanon, Christians, which is, there's a lot of divisions between them, Sunnis, and Shis, right? Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other things mixed in, Druze, and they're a mountain, mountainous place, so there's a lot of different sects which have survived that died off in other places. But generally, the way that the law is in Lebanon, the way the Constitution is written in Lebanon, is that you represent your sect. So when you vote, you don't vote as, you know, a Lebanese. You vote as a member of this sect. And it's written on your identity card and your voting card, right? And, you know, delegates are assigned by sect, right? And then certain positions in government are, are designated by the sect, by what sect you are, right? So the prime minister uh, is always going to be uh, Christian. The president is always going to be Sunni, and the uh, speaker of the parliament is always going to be Shi. It doesn't matter who votes for what, you know? It doesn't, it, you know, if everyone votes against, if only one guy votes for one Christian, he's going to be the prime minister. That's how it works, right? Uh, other places have come up with different ideas. Iraq simply ignores the issue in their constitution, right? They say, oh, we've had sectarian problems in the past. We're going to be beyond that, right? Uh, and we're going to ignore the issue. Now, that doesn't mean the issue goes away, because Iraq actually has adopted de facto a very similar situation, a uh, very similar system than that Lebanon has, right? Uh, the prime minister is almost always, he always has been Xi. The president has been Kurd, and the speaker of the parliament has always been uh, Sunni. But that's not written into the law. That just happens to be how it, things have settled, right? Their official policy is to simply ignore it. You know, pretend like it doesn't, uh, like it doesn't matter. Saudi Arabia and some other places have official discrimination. Saudi Arabia, so they're uh, Wahhabis, right? Which we'll hear more about. They're a uh, a very fundamentalist sect of Sunni Islam, right? And they think that Shi'is are wrong. Shi'is shouldn't have any sort of say in, in in what goes on, and they don't. And they're officially pushed out. They're officially marginalized, right? So here we have three different ways of dealing with this. Uh, one is to ensure sectarian rights. The other is to simply ignore the issue. And the other is to uh, marginalize the guys you don't like. Right? OK. So now we're getting up closer to the uh, contemporary period. Before the Arab Spring, well, Iraq and the Iraq War what happens in 2003 really is what brings this issue to the, to the forefront. Prior to 2003, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Uh, yes, specialists knew about Sunnis and Shis. You know, uh, you might have heard about it every once in a while in the news or, or in book. But uh, really, after 2003, you start seeing you know, tons of monographs, uh, academic conferences, articles. Uh, you know, the newspaper's full of Sunnis and Shis, right? Because it's something, something happened to, to ignite this. And what happens if we look back to this map that we were looking at before? So we have this blob of, of Shis, right, in the south, right? Uh, and these states, we should remember, were created in a time of, at least people thought it was a time of nationalism, right? So they, they divided states along national borders, right? And Iraq and Iran are basically divided between, well, the top is Kurd, we won't worry about that for now, but basically Arabs are on the Iraqi side and Persians are on the Iranian side, right? This is not exact. There are some Arabs on the Iranian side and, and there's always been a lot of Persians down in, the, in southern Iraq. But generally that's how it is. And if you look at the map, Arab versus Shi, that map makes sense. But if you look at it along sectarian lines, that map doesn't make sense, right? Because it looks like southern Iraq should be part of Iran in this, you know, if we're, if we're mapping it out this way. But with the legacy of the Ottoman Empire, which we've heard about, uh, Sunnis were ruling, Sunni Arabs were ruling, uh, were ruling Iraq. They were the elites, you know, during the time of the Ottoman period, and they continue to be the elites uh, after the Ottoman period is over. But Shis are the majority of the country. They're 60%, right? uh, and they're marginalized, except for when we had the half Shi prime minister. Um, who's killed by the Ba'athist. Um, so what happens in 2003 is that the power dynamics in the country are shifted, right? Uh, America comes in and says, no, we're going to have democracy now. And when you have democracy, 60% beats 20% every time. Right? It doesn't matter who was the elite 
during the Ottoman Empire. It doesn't matter who had ruled the country for, for how long. Uh, the 60% is going to win, right? And this 60% is she. It's more closely aligned with the Iranians, right? Not, not completely. There's differences. They don't necessarily all of them like the Iranians. There's certainly uh, a difference, but they're, they're much closer to the Iranians than the Sunnis were, right? The Sunnis absolutely despise the Iranians. The Sunni Arabs despise the Iranians. And the Shi'i Arabs, they might say, oh, the Iranians, uh, we're not Iranian, but the Iranians are okay. But this doesn't only shift what happens in Iraq. Uh, what it does is it creates a different regional map, geopolitics of sectarianism, we could say, right? Uh, and you have people that start discussing what's called a Shi crescent. I think actually the King of Jordan is the one who first came up with this idea, right? And if we remember from our other map, along the eastern coast of, the, of Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula there, there are the Shi populations. And they're connected up through Iran, through Iraq, which is a, uh, you know, 60% and now ruled by uh, a Shi government, right? And this arc continues on through Syria, which though it's a majority Sunni, has an Alawite president, right? And then down through Lebanon, which Shi here says 32%. We don't really know because it's impossible to do a uh, survey there because that would alter their whole uh, balance. Uh, but the Shi are, are clearly the largest sect, even if they're not the majority, right? So you have this large... Shi population, and it sort of goes through and creates this strategic arc throughout the Middle East, right? And this is very closely tied to Iran, right? Which is the major power sort of keeping this together, which, of course, Americans don't really like. Uh, a lot of the Sunni Arab countries in the region don't really like. And people start talking about, wow, look at this, the whole Middle East now as a result of the Iraq war, of the uh, destabilization that the, the war created. We're creating a new balance of power with this Xi crescent. A lot of stuff is written about it. A lot of people are worried. A lot of hand-wringing going on. What do we do about this? What can we do about that? Right? But if we think about that, what was going on prior to the Arab Spring, the Xi crescent is it's clearly important, right? It's very important. But it doesn't necessarily define the regional politics of the Middle East prior to the Arab Spring. During the, if we think about the major events that took place in uh, the decade before the aughts, you want to call it, of uh, 2000. Uh, okay, the Iraq War is clearly a big deal, and this is, there is the Sunni-Shi uh, conflict in there, right? But the other events are slightly different, right? So 2006, Israel fights a war with uh, Gaza and southern Lebanon, right, Hezbollah. Uh, 2009, Israel fights another war in Gaza. And then we can also see, as a result of, of the Iraq war, the general rise of, of Iranian ambitions, Iranian hegemony in the region. These are, in addition to Iraq, these are the three major issues which are uh, defining regional politics in the Middle East uh, prior to the Arab Spring. And if we look at the way the different regional actors line up on these conflicts, Right? So, if you say groups that oppose war with Israel and oppose Iranian power, right? these are sort of a standard way of, of maybe looking at where, where different groups were. Uh, well, Israel, of course, opposed war with Israel, right? uh, and they don't like Iran very much. Uh, the Sunni, Sunni Arab monarchies were quiet about it, but they also opposed war with Israel. They did not support Hezbollah uh, in its, its war with Israel. They did not support Hamas. Uh, in the war with Israel. And you have Sunni Wahhabis, who, as we mentioned before, they're the ones that are uh, coming out of Saudi Arabia, the very fundamentalist Sunnis who do not like Shis for theological reasons, and therefore didn't support groups like Hezbollah, which are Shi. Now, on the other side, the people who supported these wars with Israel and really supported Iran Iranian ambitions in the region. You have Shi, Hezbollah, right? Hezbollah, if you all right, remember, is they're in southern, uh, they're made up the Shi's of, of southern Lebanon. They're very closely tied to uh, Iran. In fact, they come out, they, they only appear after the Iranian uh, revolution, and they accept the, uh, the supreme leader of Iran as their, their spiritual leader. So they're very closely tied to Iran. But Sunni Hamas is also in here, right? In fact, and these guys are aligned in this pre Arab Spring Middle East. And in fact, if we remember, why did the 2006 war? begin, 
Well, the 2006 war didn't begin in southern, southern Lebanon. It began in Gaza. Again, it's Israel and Hamas. And in comes Hezbollah in defense of the Sunnis, right? So the Shis are coming in in defense of the Sunnis against Israel, right? Then you have the Sunni Muslim Brotherhood, which is all over the place, but mostly based in, uh, in Egypt. This is where the headquarters are. And they're having street demonstrations and writing in the paper. And they're not in power, but they're doing whatever they can do to help those that are fighting Israel. And they're also, at least rhetorically, supporting Iran. They're saying America and Israel, they shouldn't be worried about Iranian ambitions. Iran is good, there are good Muslims there. Uh, and you know, the, their enemy, the United States, is clearly the bad guy. It's not the Iranians who are bad in this. And, and if they have you know, plans to build an atomic weapon, which they probably don't, it wouldn't be that bad anyway. They're saying this sort of thing, right? Then you have semi-Shi Syria, which I said they're Alawis, right? So it's a type of, of Shiism. Um, they're very much aligned with everybody. Hamas, Hamas' headquarters is in Damascus. Sunni Hamas' headquarters is in Damascus, right? Uh, the capital of the semi-Shi uh, Syria, which is also closely aligned with uh, with Iran. And then you also have Turkey sort of entering the picture. During this period, Turkey, like I said, they have you know, zero problems with their neighbors. That's their, their slogan. Um, and they are really, you know, they don't like Israel that much. They're, they're su supporting those who are against Israel. Um, they're making visits. You know, the, the prime minister of, of Turkey is making these visits to Iran. He's shaking hands with Ahmadinejad. They're, they're being very nice. And the United States is getting very worried about this because it's, it's a NATO country. But if we look at this column here, right, we see Shi, Sunni, Shi, Sunni, Semi-Shi, Sunni. They're all together in a block, right? So even though, yes, there's some rumblings of sectarianism, right, and there is this, this uh, Sunni-Shi divide and this Shi crescent that's making its way across the Middle East, it's not yet defining geopolitics in the region. It's not yet defining the alliances. It's, an, it's a factor. It's becoming increasingly important, but it's not yet the factor, the only thing that matters, right? So now we're going to talk a little bit about the Arab Spring. And particularly, we're going to talk about Syria, because Egypt is all Sunni, right? There are some, there are some uh, there are Christians there, but they, they don't play a role in the geopolitics. Libya, it was tribal conflicts. There was no Sunni-Shi factor. Tunisia, same thing. But, but Syria actually plays a big role, right? Because Syria, as we've mentioned, is ruled by this Alawi minority. The majority of people, on the other hand, are Sunnis, right? So when the Arab Spring first takes, takes place in places like Egypt, you know, it's, it's the people rising up against the dictator, right? And the people that are rising up are, OK, you have these uh, young Twitter, Twitterati, or whatever you want to call them. Um, but you also have the Islamists and the Muslim Brotherhood, right? So groups like Iran are actually supporting this. They try to say it's an Islamic you know, uh, revolution, not just a popular Arab revolution, but, a, but an Islamic revolution. Because as we know now, the Islamists are actually the ones you know, pushing this thing from behind the scenes, even if they're letting the Twitterati take uh, front stage. But when things go to Syria, then we have a problem, right? Because the group's society rises up. Again, the Islamists are very much involved in this. The Sunni Muslim Brotherhood in Syria, which had been repressed for many years, is rising up. And they're being aided by their Sunni brethren uh, across the region who are also fighting against their own dictators. So the Sunni Muslim Brotherhood in, in Egypt sees that the Sunni Muslim Brotherhood in Syria is also fighting against their dictator. So of course, they're going to help them, right? But this causes significant problems in that, what we saw before, in this uh, alignment here. And especially for a country like Iran, because if we think back to this, the Shi Crescent, right, Syria is right in the middle of it, right? So if Iran's going to help its, its, uh, its allies, Hezbollah and Lebanon, it needs to go through Syria, logistics, right? If it's going so to send weapons, missiles, aid, right? It's not going to be able to send them around uh, you don't want to, you can. They've, they've started to now send them, you know, by ship through the Suez Canal, but this is a tricky, this is a tricky, tricky business to do this, right? When you get out in the open seas, it's, it's much more difficult. The Americans can do things, the Israelis can do things. 
It's much better to send things across the land. You already have the Iraqis looking the other way because you have a Shi government there that doesn't want to upset you, and they're sort of winking at you and nodding and letting you go. And then you have Syria pumping this stuff into southern Lebanon, right? So Syria is very much a logistics hub, right, for, uh, for the Iranians, for the Shi crescent. It becomes a type of linchpin that's holding it together, right? It's not going to hold together without this government in Syria. But meanwhile, you're having the people uh, rise up. So this puts Iran and the Shi people who are trying to keep the Shi crescent together in a difficult position vis-a-vis -vis their Sunni allies. And what you see is this. So post-Arab spring, right, we have uh, the big issue that's come up in the last few years anyway has been what to do about Syria, right? Oppose the regime and support the rebels. Well, we have the Sunni Arab monarchies, we have the Wahhabis. These are the same groups that were on the same side during uh, the pre-Arab spring. But then we have a bunch of groups that have come over, right? The Sunni Muslim Brotherhood is now completely opposed to uh, the regime in Syria. Hamas, which had its, its, uh, its headquarters in Damascus, left, right? The regime gave them a choice. Listen, you're either going to support us or you're going to leave. They decided to leave because their Sunni brothers are being slaughtered in the streets and they can't support the regime that's going to do that, right? Turkey. The Prime Minister of Turkey thought that Assad was his great friend. You know, they, they had a good relationship prior to the uh, Arab Spring. The relationship has been destroyed. And Turkey is now firmly with its, within the camp of its Sunni brethren. And speaking in very, the Prime Minister is now speaking in very sectarian terms. Whereas before it was, oh, our, we're all Muslims, Sunnis and Shias together. He doesn't speak like that anymore. Uh, he talks about, uh, you know, Sunnis, and he has sort of coded words uh, to talk about Shias, which are very bad. And, I mean, it's not just organizations, people themselves. Uh, as Alan mentioned, I was very interested in a guy named Yusuf al Kardawi. So he's very indicative. He's a, a Sunni, Sunni leader. I should have written his name down here, but uh, he's a, probably the most influential Sunni religious leader. Prior to the Arab Spring, he was preaching a uh, uh, tolerance between the sects, right? Uh, he met with uh, Iranian leaders on television, Raf Sanjani, the former president of Iran, uh, during the height of the civil war in Iraq to say, no, listen, we're, we got to come together. We're all, you know, uh, we're all Muslims, and we can't let these you know, outside imperialists come in and, and mess us up like they're doing, and cause us to fight each other, when we really, what we really should be doing is fighting Israel and fighting the United States. Uh, since the Arab Spring, he's changed his tune. Now he says that Iran is, you know, uh, the worst enemy of the world. Iran responded. Of course, he would say that because he's a known Zionist agent, which if you know anything about Yusuf al-Kardawi, is a pretty absurd thing to say. But um, he also has, you know, over the summer released a fatwa that basically all Sunnis need to start coming to Syria to fight against these evil Shis, right? So this is a complete reversal for him. And he's really, I mean, a lot of people say he's like the pulse of, of the Sunni Arab world, right? Uh, uh, what he says is he tries consciously to, uh, to be in the middle, right? To, to, uh, to be where the crowd is. So he's a sort of good indicator of what's going on. Uh, groups like Hezbollah, right, decided, no, they're going to stay with Syria. They're going to stay with Iran. And this has really broken the position of Hezbollah in the Sunni Arab world, right? Uh, Hassan Nasrallah, who is the head of Hezbollah, after the 2006 war with Israel, was a hero. I mean, everyone is, is uh, loving this guy on the Sunni Arab street. Now they can't stand him. Right? Uh, so it's really altered the situation. And what's happened is the Shis have all ended up on one side, and the Sunnis have all ended up on the other side. And as this has happened, it's taken a more and more sectarian undertones, right? Uh, the conflicts that are erupting across the Middle East are now erupting clearly on sectarian lines. So if we think of some of the major conflicts uh, that are happening right now, they're spreading out of this, uh, this sectarianism. Iraq had sort of tampered down damper down, you know, now the Americans left, there's a lot of different factors going on there, but it, it's back. I mean, I think this year is going to 
there's going to be more people killed in Iraq this year than in 2008, right? So any, any progress we made, the surge or whatever you want to call it, it's all gone. Uh, Sunnis and Shis are slaughtering each other I mean, daily. And they're, they're fighting. They're both sending people to Syria to fight, right? So the Sunnis from Al-Anbar province, from western Iraq, are sending people to go fight with uh, the Al-Qaeda groups and the Salafis who are fighting against the regime in, uh, in Syria. In fact, they've, they've merged, right? So now you have, you used to have the uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Now you have Al-Qaeda in Syria and Iraq. They, they've sort of come together, right? But then the Shi'i militias also are coming. The ones that, that had, had really cut their teeth fighting the Americans, you know, Sadr's groups, are now sending people into Syria to defend the regime, right? And to fight against their, so you have Iraqi Sunnis fighting Iraqi Shi'is in Iraq, but also in Syria, right? In Bahrain, Bahrain is another interesting case where it's a Shi'i majority, but it's ruled by a Sunni monarchy. Uh, and this is blown up again, right? Uh, it blew up with the Arab Spring, and now there's just been a constant sort of simmer there of sectarian uh, tensions. Lebanon. Lebanon always suffered sectarianism probably longer than anyone else in the Middle East, but it's being inflamed now, and Lebanon is really on the brink. We're seeing already uh, you know, bombings going off in, in, in Le inside Lebanon, Sunnis versus Shis. Hezbollah has been helping the regime. They're sending over their militias into, into fight against the Sunnis, right? And then some of the Sunnis in, in Lebanon are now also crossing over and fighting against uh, Hezbollah. So you have Lebanese not so much fighting in Lebanon, but definitely fighting against each other in Syria. So right now, the Middle East has basically erupted into uh, a sectarian conflict. Um, along the lines that, I don't know, we haven't seen this uh, region-wide, probably never, uh, at least in the modern period. There's never been anything that has been this cut and dry. Uh, and as I said, when sectarianism matters, it really matters. And right now, it really matters. Uh, it matters more than uh, other sort of conflicts over borders. It's, it's, it's creating a lot of havoc. So the question is, what happens next? Well, as historians, we sort of can look back to the past and say, it, there's a, say, well, it isn't always like this, right? Um, and we know that it's tempting right now to just say, yes, of course, Sunnis and Shis, they hate each other. They always have, they always will. And they'll always be fighting each other. Uh, and there's nothing we can do about it except for just sort of stand back and, and, and let them kill each other. But we know that you know, th that hasn't always been the case. And the question that we need to ask, which is probably not an answer to, is how much have things changed? How much has this inflaming of sectarian identities over the last few years, you know, starting a decade ago, but really taking shape over, uh, over the last uh, you know, a few years of the Arab Spring, how much has that set in? How much will that continue to define, uh, especially after Syria's over, right? Syria is a mess. I don't know if there is going to be a Syria, as we heard, in the future, but someday it's going to be over, right? At some time, some point in the future, it's going to, people are going to stop fighting. They're going to get tired of it. For whatever reason, one side's going to win. Who knows what's going to happen? Something's going to happen. It's going to be over. And the question is, what happens then? Are the sectarian tensions, have they been so inflamed that there's just no going back? We've crossed the threshold that, you know, these memories are there and they're not going to go away? Or are we going to go back to start seeing other groups maybe fighting in according or aligning in accordance with their interests, right? Not necessarily with their sectarian ties, but aligning with their interests or ideologies? Are you going to see other groups try to create, you know, some sort of reconciliation between uh, between the sects, and will they be successful in doing so? We don't know. Um, but when we're looking forward, these are the sort of questions that I guess uh, we're going to have to ask. I mean, I guess one thing we could say is that as long as Syria goes on, continues to go on, and the sides stay aligned, it's just going to get worse. Uh, it's not going to get better anytime soon. But when Syria does end, that's going to be a question of, of, of where, where do we go? Uh, how much of these identities have been uh, entrenched? And uh, that's it for my presentation, so I'll take some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam, and we'll go to Joseph Otrosky.
have a, a question that deals with will the Sunnis, specifically Saudi Arabia, let Iran become nuclear? Um, well, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, I wish I had the answer for you. You know, I, uh, I don't. I, I think, I don't think the Saudis, I don't think the Saudis can stop it on their own, right? They can push the Americans. They can wink and nod at Israel. Um, I think right now the Saudis have a plan uh, to basically get their own bomb if Iran gets theirs. That, that seems to be their plan. And they, they sort of have one because um, they, the Pakistanis, as you know, have, have a bomb, right? Uh, but that was, those were, it was done with Saudi money. And the idea, at least the assumption amongst a lot of people who know a lot more about this than I do, is that uh, there's a sort of implicit deal when the Saudis did this, that if we need one, you'll give it to us. Uh, and the idea is if the Iranians are able to build a bomb, if, if, if they go, uh, then the Saudis will just simply take back what they already consider to be theirs. And this way, there'll be some sort of detente between our, our you know, standoff, some sort of between the two. The question, though, is, uh, of course, more complicated than that. Because Iran probably isn't going to actually build the bomb, right, or test it. They might do something else. They might do something, for example, just uh, have all the pieces together, right? And you have all the pieces together. And this is obviously really simplified uh, and simplistic. But you know, let's just say you put all the pieces in the room, and you just have to put them together. And it'll take you 10 minutes to just assemble it. But you never do assemble it. And this way, you can always say, no, no, we, you know, uh, we never, we, we're not going to do it, right? And we don't have a bomb, right? Uh, the question is, for Saudi Arabia, at what point does that cross the threshold where they feel that they uh, need to respond? And of course, it's not just a question for Saudi Arabia. It's a question for the United States. It's a question for Israel. And Saudi Arabia is saying that they are going to acquire a bomb from Pakistan, that they already have one from Pakistan, in some ways might also be seen as a way to try to pressure the United States into acting. Because the United States does not want a proliferation you know, uh, of this. If Saudi Arabia gets one, and then maybe Egypt, and then UAE, and then it's just a matter of time before someone goes crazy and you know, decides to use it. Um, so there's a lot of different moving, uh, moving pieces, but I wish I could tell you uh, exactly. The Ba'ath Party's relationship to the Sunni-Shia divide, you talked about the party was founded by white Christians, ba uh, Sunnis, and Shia, and that is the ruling party of the regime. So to what extent is this more political than religious? Well, this Ba'ath Party, yes. And the Ba'ath Party actually ruled in two different places, right? It ruled in, in Iraq and uh, now in Syria. Uh, and in Iraq, it was, it was dominated by the Sunnis, at least when they were in power. When they first actually came to Iraq, there was, they were run, it was mostly Shis uh, in, in the 1950s. And the first general guide of the Iraqi Ba'ath Party was uh, a Shi himself. But for a number of reasons, which historians debate, uh, the Sunnis end up uh, running the Iraqi Ba'ath Party and are looked at um, really as being Sunnis first. right? Uh, and then the Alawis, in, Syria, for a number of different historical reasons, which again are debated, uh, end up being in charge of, of the Ba'ath Party in Syria. And these two Ba'ath parties, they don't like each other. Right? They, never, they, never, they never do. Um, so it's hard to say that there's an inherent sectarianism built into Ba'athism. right? Because as you say, it's founded by a Christian. It's not founded by a Sunni or a Shi. Right? And then you have this one proto-Shi group that sort of takes charge of one branch of the Ba'ath Party, one Sunni group that takes charge of another, uh, another uh, part of the Ba'ath Party. But in each case, what you find is that um, the leaders, they have an ideal of Arabism, right, and non-sectarianism. But in the end, they have to rely, being dictators, being, being in charge of non-democratic states, right, uh, you have to rely on people that you trust to, uh, to support you. You came to, to power during a coup, and someone else could easily you know, do the same to you. So the people you trust most are your family members, people who lived around you, people you've known the longest, right? And over the years, it becomes de facto and de facto more like you, right? So Saddam, his family becomes, as he goes, uh, as, as he goes through uh, 
you know, acquires more and more power and becomes more and more paranoid, uh, his inner circle and the senior people in the regime are, become more and more his family, people from his hometown, which makes them more and more Sunni, right? Uh, and this creates some sort of sectarian tension, right? Not by design, just sort of by default. And the same thing you have in Syria. I mean, the Ba'ath Party in Syria doesn't start off as Alawi, but as the Alawis become president, uh, and they start empowering the people around them, right? Assad's family is the one that's running Syria right now. Um, it, 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 you know, becomes more and more Alawi, and this creates problems, because if you're a Sunni majority, you say, why can't I have some power, right? Because I'm not a, this minority Alawi? And the same happened in Iraq. But we have to remember that this isn't designed on sectarianism, say, like, like Wahhabism is designed to be sectarianism, right? It's sectarian. They don't like the Shis, right? Uh, they think the Shis are bad. The Ba'ath Party never quite says that. I mean, Assad's wife is, 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 is not Alawi, right? Uh, and high-ranking officials in, in Saddam's party continued to be Shi until the end. So it wasn't a sort of ideological uh, opposition. It was more of a practical, security-driven, uh, de facto sectarianism, I guess you could call it. Uh, you kind of answered my question regarding if this was more of a religious or political conflict um, across this region. But um, more specifically, what is the role of foreign intervention, especially Russia, on, on the Syrian conflict? And what is their stake in, in the region? Um, OK, so well, I will just maybe clarify again that sometimes it's de facto, like, a, like a, in the case of the Ba'ath Party. Other times, it is ideological. There are clearly, you know, Al-Qaeda does not like Shis, and they want to kill them, right? <laughs> That's, uh, there's no way around that, right? And there are Shi'is who, who feel the same way about Sunnis. So there, it's, a, it's a complicated cocktail of, of different reasons. Uh, and I would, wouldn't say that it's one or the other, but the combination of the two. So Russia in the region now, uh, I mean, of course, Russia doesn't care about Sunnism or Shi'ism. They care about their own interests, because they're not Muslim, right? And they, have, they could really care less. Um, but in a sort of de facto way, they've aligned now the way that this uh, we could say, we could put Russia now in the right-hand column, clearly, right? Uh, they're supporting Syria, you know, wholeheartedly. Uh, logistically, that's going, that's, that help is coming through Iran because, you know, the borders, the way they work, right? Um, so Russia is clearly on this side, and the Sunnis have reacted. Um, you see Sunnis now, you know, talking about Russia as being the enemy of the Muslims, um, which never, that, that was always the place for the, for the Americans, right? <laughs> the Americans were always the sort of big, the great Satan, right? Um, and now Russia has sort of trumped us. Uh, as they're, they're now, you know, a bigger problem uh, than, than we are uh, um, in, the, in the eyes of many uh, Islamist or sectarian Sunnis. Of course, the Shias don't look at it that way. Um, I don't know that they trump, they, they really highlight that they're being supported by the Russians because it doesn't really help them one way or the other, but they're not attacking the Russians. They think the Russians are actually helping them. But it's causing problems like, for example, with Turkey and Russia, you know, who are, who are very, very close to each other. Um, it's causing a lot of, a lot of problems between them, uh, trade-wise and all sorts of different things going on. Can you explain a little bit about the connection between um, the Alawites and the Christians? And also, um, to that, I've, I've seen some alignment of public opinion outside of Syria along those lines. Um, and I was wondering if you might be able to elaborate on how that might affect the, um, the ex uh, expat Syrian community, how the expat Syrian community's position might affect foreign policy yeah. on that. Um, so what happens in a lot of these states, and this goes back really to the Ottoman Empire, right? There's a certain mentality among religious minorities in uh, the Middle East in that the state has been their protector, right? Uh, generally, this has been the case. Uh, under the Ottomans' uh, example, um, there were some riots, you know, in Syria, Lebanon, and other places against Christians, right? And the state, the Ottomans would come in and, and, uh, and help, right? 
uh, make sure that this minority isn't getting slaughtered. Right? That, that's sort of what they would do. The same things happen in places like Egypt, right? Uh, Egypt, Mubarak, you know, for whatever bad stuff he did, he sort of protected the Christians against uh, some of the more radical, uh, um, just the masses, right? The masses are the ones who always sort of carry out these, these massacres, right? Uh, and so in Syria, what you have is a situation where, um, again, it's this, the Christians know that the state has been protecting them, right? And you have really a radicalized uh, opposition who is not going to protect them, who's going to, their, their lives are going to be endangered uh, if they, uh, if, the, if the regime ever falls. Uh, well, their lives are already, been, in places where the regime has receded, I mean, they're already in, in big trouble. Um, my wife and I know the, well, knew the Archbishop of Aleppo, and he's missing, <laughs> you know, he's gone. Um, any place where, the state has basically receded, the, the crowds, the masses, the mob, whatever you want to call it, um, whether by ideological reasons or you just need, you know, you don't have bread and this minority does, so you take it from the weak, right? And the Christians are always in that, in that sort of situation. So for the Christians, and this was the case for the Jews also, by the way, when there were Jewish communities in the Middle East, it was, it was sort of the same thing. When the state fell, the, the Jews and the Christians always, always got it good. Um, so the Christians are sort of dependent on, on having some sort of state, in this case it's the Bath, Bathist state, uh, protect them. So it puts them in a strange situation. You talk to a lot of Syrian Christians and, you know, they understand that Assad is a pretty horrible guy. And he's doing pretty horrible stuff. But on the other hand, they don't want to get killed. <laughs> you know, so um, it's sort of a lesser evil uh, for them. And I think, at least in the states, uh, as far as foreign policy, I'm not sure that it's affecting it so much, but it's certainly one brick in the wall of opposition to uh, intervention in Syria and opposition to toppling the regime is what's going to happen, you know, uh, if we do that, and what's going to happen to these these minorities, right? The same question was asked in Egypt, right? And we found out the answer: it's very bad, you know. If if uh, you know when the Muslim Brotherhood takes over, the Christians don't have a very good uh, good time, uh, and now that the dictatorship is back in Egypt, it's may be bad for a whole bunch of reasons, but it's, it's better for the Christians. You know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, that's the unfortunate reality. Um, and I know it's very difficult for a lot of Christians to actually have to deal with this, but uh, that's the case. Any other questions? We here? No? Yeah. Um, I have uh, two questions. One, the first one actually might reveal my ignorance of, of some of the subject matter. Um, but the first one is just the identifying factors of Sunni versus Shi. Um, is it simply segregation? You, you had explained how um, w with uh, borders, how there's overlap. And I was just wondering, I mean, what are the identifying factors when there's these these car bombs that go off or or the the killings between people of the same country, um, between those two se sects? And then the other question I had is, um, has American foreign policy begun or have they uh, taken sectarian sides after the the Arab Springs as well, um, as compared to before? Um, so the first question. A lot of times there is there's names, there's certain names which are known to be she, right? Names. Um, in some places, depending on where you are, uh, you have it on your ID card, right? So there's cases of Iraqis who would have, you know, two or three different ID cards, and they're traveling through these different checkpoints, and uh, people would they'd come to a checkpoint and say it's the Sunnis running the checkpoint, and if you were a she, they'd just kill you. Right, uh, and the same, and the opposite happened too. Right, uh, and it's still happening today. So people would have different ID cards. One says they're Sunni and has a Sunni name, and one says they're Shi and has you know uh, a Shi name. Um, there are also you know where you're from. Right, certain towns are all Sunni. Some certain towns are all are all Shi. So there's there's dialects and ways of of speaking. This happened in Lebanon as well. They would ask you to uh, pronounce. I think it was tomato. Yeah, it was tomato. They would stop you at a checkpoint and ask you to pronounce tomato. And certain groups pronounced it one way, and certain groups pronounced it the other way. And if you pronounced it wrong, it was not good for you. Um, so there's different ways, but it's, it's not always cut and dry, like anything else, like ethnicity. 
you know, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to tell. Um, and that's why people could have these different ID cards, right, in certain cases. In some cases, it didn't matter. Um, so Americans have tried not to take sides, but, you know, clearly we're supporting uh, the Sunnis in a lot of cases sort of by default uh, now. Like, we, in Iraq, we tried not to. Uh, in Iraq, we still, I mean, I think we still, even uh, the Prime Minister of Iraq is in America right now, and uh, the, the American administration, like previous administrations, is, is really hammering him behind closed doors about tr his treatment of the Sunnis, which isn't nice. He's not treating them very well. Um, so in this case, we're taking the side of the Sunnis, protecting them in many ways, saying, you know, you need to really give them more uh, political freedoms or uh, make them a part of the, the political class in Iraq. But generally, because Iran is Shi, and because Iranian ambitions are uh, sometimes considered zero sum with the American ambitions in the Middle East, we share, you know, we have, you know, we're each other's enemies for, for, for better or worse. We have supported, uh, we, we've generally opposed this Shi crescent forming, right? Hezbollah is, not, is very anti America. And connecting Hezbollah, Syria, and Iran, these are three you know, pillars of anti-Americanism in the region. And our allies um, are on the other side of this, right? If you think of Jordan, which has been our you know, topic, I guess, uh, of conversation here. Uh, Jordan, you know, they don't like this. The, the Jordanian king was the one who, who talked about the Shi crescent to begin with. And it's because uh, he sees it as a threat, and Jordan's a great ally. Uh, of the United States. Uh, Israel doesn't like it either, right? Because this brings Iran right to their doorstep, right? Right into southern Lebanon, right into the border. So Israel doesn't like this. Um, the Saudis, you know, maybe we're having a little bit of a rocky relationship right now, but traditionally we've been allies. You know, the Egyptians, we were under Mubarak. We weren't so much under Morsi. Now we are again a little bit, kind of, sort of. Who knows? They also don't like uh, the Iranians. So I guess the people that we like don't like it, <laughs> you know, don't like the Shis. Generally, the Sunnis have been better to us, but I don't think that America likes to, the American administration wouldn't like to put it in those terms, even though that's sort of been the case. Adam Garfin. All these questions are, are policy contemporary questions and much too easy. So I want to ask you a, a historical <laughs> the, theoretical question. Um, in those who interpret the history of Islam will make the sometimes make the following argument: in the in the debate between uh, Sunnis and Sh the Sh Shiat Ali in the early days, Battle of Karbala, uh, make the argument that the Sunnis, what the Sunnis did, what the original Islamic rebellion revolt did, was it unified the tribes of Arabia and made them enormously powerful by trying to suppress the dynastic principle, and that the argument that the successor to Muhammad should be, should be selected according to merit rather than, rather than blood was a truly revolutionary, um, re revolutionary perspective, whereas the Shia, by resorting to the idea that uh, heredity should be the defining principle of succession, were really the uh, re they were reactionaries, retrograde types. Um, how much uh, credence would you, would, do you put in, in an interpretation like that, a sort of a broad sociological interpretation of that old argument? Um, I guess not much, <laughs> uh, to put it simply. Uh, I think it's probably, maybe at the time there might have been, yeah, there might have been something like that. There's, there's, there's a lot of studies on, you know, uh, maybe Islam is having dual, dual natured, you know, you have a one side, uh, you do have this conservative tribalism, which is in the Quran, right? It's not that it's not in the Quran, right? The Quran talks about tribes as a good thing. Um, and then on the other side, you have this radical equality of everybody, which goes against this whole idea of asabiya, you know, of, of, of kinship networks being more important. So this is sort of embedded into Islam. This 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 uh, this tension is is embedded into the, the original. Uh, sources. And yeah, I mean, you could make the argument that one is, is better than the other. Um, I try not to put some sort of uh, value judgment on it. I don't think that the Shis or the Sunnis actually view it that way. I think they actually view it in terms of, 
yes, Muhammad told Ali that you're the successor, or no, he didn't, right? And maybe there was some interesting repercussions that came out of that argument, that sociological repercussions, but that's generally how they understand it, right? And I would be um, hesitant to, I would be hesitant to project my own sort of views onto it uh, more than what they themselves understand their own religion. Okay, Todd Whitman. Um, I've been sitting here trying to formulate a question and I had a really hard time with it. Uh, so maybe I'll just ask you to comment. But on my way out here yesterday, I was driving the Pennsylvania Turnpike from uh, the eastern part of the state and I was listening to an NPR interview with, I believe it was the Deputy Prime Minister of Iraq. And it was a, I just thought of the interesting kind of predicament that the US government's in right now in that the Iraqi government is here asking for military assistance, uh, mainly in the form of helicopters and fighter jets, because they're saying they have absolutely no air force and they have no way of stopping Iranian arms shipments to Syria. And so, <laughs> and, and he's pointing out that we're trying to fight, we need these fighter jets and we need these helicopters to fight Al Qaeda in Iraq, knowing full well that's probably a pretty strong buzzword in the United States. So I guess, if I had any question to ask, if you had to bet your house on, <laughs> on the U.S. aiding, you know, in terms of military hardware, the Iraqi government in its current state, with all the issues going on, on all around Iraq, what would you, what do you think would happen? I know that's totally hypothetical. That's the best I can do. Yeah. Uh, wow. So, betting my house, I don't know, my wife here might, uh, <laughs> might object. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> I, mean, I guess the situation that we find ourselves in with Iraq today is, yeah, the deputy prime minister can say whatever he wants. I mean, the, they, could, they could at least put some pressure on, on Iran about these shipments, right? These shipments are flying over, and Iraq, it's interesting that he's saying that now because up until now he's been saying, no, there's no shipments, right? And we said, no, there, there definitely are. Uh, and so then they will coordinate with the Iranians, right? to make sure that there's a shipment with no weapons on it, right? And they'll stop it. And they've done this a few times, right? And they do a big, you know, they bring the whole press in, and, and they bring all the cameras, and, oh, no, just aid for the poor, suffering Syrians. You know, look what we're doing. We're just, you know. Uh, but of course, this is all coordinated. So if the Iraqis wanted to work with the United States to try to stop, uh, you know, arms shipments or something like that, sure there's ways that it could be done. You know, uh, probably not with giving Iranian, uh, Iraqis, uh, um, you know, uh, without giving Iraqis F-16s or something like that. I mean, Americans can do it, right? If Iraqis say it's a problem, just have the Americans come in and do it. Um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, it's a buzzword in America, but it's not simply a buzzword in America. It's a huge problem in Iraq right now. I mean, it's, it's every day. The Iraqi papers are, it's, I mean, it's daily. Dozens of people just getting slaughtered. Uh, kids, I mean, there was one a couple weeks ago, they just car bomb into a preschool. Just blew up everybody. So it's not simply a buzzword for America. They're, they're really having a lot of problems. Um, I, I know they asked Americans to actually come in with drones and say, yes, please do like, you know, like you're doing to Yemen or Pakistan, please, you know, do that to us. Right? Um, but, you know, the Americans said, um, said no uh, for, for whatever reason, I think probably, you know, part of it's political, right? This administration got out of Iraq, <laughs> you know, good riddance, right? I don't think there's very many Americans who have very much appetite for, you know, going back and, and, and especially putting Americans' lives in risk, uh, at risk to go, to go do that. And the other alternative is to give sophisticated weapons to a regime which we don't know that much. You know, they're really, they're, they're in pretty tight with the Iranians. I mean, they're, they're coordinating a lot of things. So um, I think it's probably, uh, if I had to bet, I would say that we're not going to uh, aid them, and we're going to let this simmer. And uh, there'll be some pressure to do some things, but I wouldn't want to send, you know, Americans to go fight that war again. So. Well, join me in thanking Sam Helfont. <laughs>